Good morning, everybody. It is an honor and a blessing to get to share God's Word with you one more time. Hope that you had a great 4th of July. And, uh, you know, I just have to say, we are so blessed to be living in a country where we can still worship the Lord, where we can still share the gospel. This morning, we're going to take a look once again at the life of Samson. Our passage is found in Judges chapter 14. And we're going to look at some of the verses that deal with Samson's life as a young man. The Bible records for us in Judges chapter 14, verse 1. Then Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. So he came back and told his father and mother, I saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me as a wife. Then his father and his mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all of our people that you should go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she looks good to me. However, his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord, for he was seeking an occasion against the Philistines. Now at that time, the Philistines were ruling over Israel. Would you pray with me, please? <clears throat> Most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. And Lord, we thank you for the love that you have bestowed upon us. And Lord, we, we're so grateful we can look at your word together. So grateful, Father, we can worship you. And Father, thank you for that freedom that we have. I pray, Father, that uh, you would continue to to bless us as we look at your word. And Father, I pray that you would bless this country, Lord. I lift up all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now this morning, I'm only going to give you an overview of the story that goes with this passage. I would ask that you please read the entire story about Samson on your own. You need to read it because nobody tells a story as good as God does. So, Please take the time this week to read chapters 14, 15, and 16 of the book of Judges. You will be blessed. Now you may recall from chapter 13 that Samson was a special child born to a couple who had never been able to have children, and the Lord gave them this gift of a son. And this son was to be dedicated to God his entire life, starting in the womb. And this dedication to the Lord was to be demonstrated by Samson living under a Nazarite vow. And under the Nazarite vow, Samson was not going to be able to cut his hair, not to drink wine, not to eat grapes, uh, not to touch a corpse, animal, or human. There were certain things under the Nazarite vow that Samson was not allowed to do. And he was not allowed to do these things so that the world would know that Samson was set apart for God. You see, the Lord wanted to use Samson in a special way. The Lord had promised that Samson one day uh, would begin to deliver the nation of Israel from the Philistines. That's a, a curious promise, isn't it? That he would begin to deliver the nation from the Philistines. Total deliverance from the enemy was not something that God was going to accomplish through Samson. It was only something that would begin through Samson. And the deliverance would begin because of the confrontations and the battles that Samson would have with the Philistines. And in these chapters in the book of Judges, there are three major confrontations between Samson and the Philistines that are described for us. All of those confrontations follow a similar pattern. The passage we just read provides the background for that first confrontation. <clears throat> And I want to look at that passage with you today in a message entitled, The Battles of Samson. And one of the first characteristics I see about the battles of Samson is that Samson had a disregard for authority in his life. See, Samson's battles did not always start for some noble, God-inspired reason. His battles often started because of some bad decision and some improper action that Samson was taking. In chapter 14, Samson is old enough to get married, and he goes to the Philistine town Timnah that's four miles away from his own hometown. And while he's there, 
he sees a Philistine woman, and to Samson, she looks good. She looks real good. She looks so good that Samson goes back home, and he tells his parents about her, and he says, go get her for me as a wife. Now, there are a couple of problems with that. One of the problems is, is that Samson is telling his parents what to do instead of asking his parents what to do. In those days, it was customary for parents to choose spouses for their children. Marriages were typically arranged in those days. And we see from the scriptures that Samson is breaking from that tradition. Now, there's nothing wrong uh, in and of itself with breaking from tradition. But instead of going to his parents and asking them, instead of going to them and having a conversation, Samson goes to his parents and begins to boss them around. He tells his parents what to do. That's not a good thing. Even if you're a grown man, you should not be disrespectful to your parents. You should continue to value their counsel. The Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, Honor your father and your mother. It's something that is repeated again in Ephesians chapter 6. Honor your father and your mother. Don't disrespect them. Don't disregard their advice. Samson is showing disregard for the parental authority that God has placed in his life. Not only that, but I see that Samson is showing disregard for God's will. The Israelites had been warned when they entered the promised land that they were not to intermarry with the people who were living there. And that's because the Canaanites and the Philistines were pagans and their idol worship, the idol worship of those pagans would cause the Israelites to forsake their own relationship with God. That's the point that Samson's father is trying to make. Uh, and his mother, when they say to him, is there no woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you should go take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistine?" And when they say uncircumcised Philistines, it's not that they're, you know, trying to throw some shade at them. It's not that they're trying to mock them or be disrespectful. That word uncircumcised is a word that indicates that that was a people who were not in a covenant relationship with God. And Samson's parents did not want Samson to be bonded with someone who would hurt his relationship with God. They did not want him to be bonded with someone who would lead him away from God. You know that, that uh, same thing holds true for us today. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? It's very important who we interact with who we fellowship with. Uh, we, we as Christians need to hang out with people with the same covenant relationship with God that we have. Now that's not to say that we don't have uh, friends who are unbelievers, but we need to make sure that we are being influenced by people who are in a covenant relationship with the Lord our God. And certainly we only need to marry someone who has a personal relationship with with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Samson wasn't thinking about the fact that this Philistine woman was not in a, uh, a covenant relationship with God. He was not uh, thinking about the fact that she didn't share his own faith. Samson was only thinking, she looks good. And so he had a total disregard for God's will. And because Samson had disregard for God's will, and for his parents' authority in his life, he was going to face a battle. Now we see from the scriptures that God is going to use that to do and accomplish what God wants to do. I, I'm thinking of Romans 8, 28 when I read verses like that. That God causes all things to work together for good for those who love Him, who are called according to His purpose. That God can take the lemons that we throw and still make lemonade. And, and Samson, I tell you what, he's making some lemons. He's doing some things that are of his own desire, not of God's own desire. And it leads to some battles in his life. But you know, the second point that I see in this uh, passage, first one was the disregard for authority that Samson had. The second one is the deliverance by God that took place. 
Let's look at Judges chapter 14, verse 5. The Bible says, Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came as far as the vineyards of Timnah. And behold, a young lion came roaring toward him. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, so that he tore him as one tears a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. But he did not tell his father and mother what he had done. So he went down and talked to the woman, and she looked good to Samson. When he returned later to take her, he turned aside to look at the carcass of the lion, and behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the body of the lion. So he scraped the honey into his hands and went on, eating as he went. When he came to his father and mother, he gave some to them, and they ate it. But he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey out of the body of a lion. Samson and his parents, they are going about arranging Samson's marriage with this Philistine woman. They go down there to see her, and, and while Samson is on his way to visit her, he's attacked by a lion. He's attacked by a lion, and God protects Samson by giving Samson the strength to fight off this lion. And Samson kills the lion with his bare hands. And I love the fact that even though Samson is on his way to do something wrong, God is still watching over him. God is still protecting him. God delivers Samson from the trouble that he causes himself. God is still looking to use Samson in his kingdom. God has not given up on Samson. Uh, in God's big picture, in his overall plan, he still wants to use Samson to begin to deliver the Israelites from the Philistines. And the reason that, that Samson is making this trip, the reason doesn't line up uh, with God's calling in his life, but yet God still builds a hedge of protection around Samson. Takes care of him. Even though Samson is somewhere, he's going somewhere he should not be going and he's doing something he should not be doing. Many times in Samson's life and in the midst of the battles and struggles, you can see God's hand there watching over him, protecting him, taking care of him. God even protected Samson from being yoked unequally and married to this Philistine woman. In the seven-day party that leads up to this marriage, uh, a big fight is started when Samson tries to act all cool and, and he bets the Philistines, some of these Philistine men, that they cannot guess his riddle. And he gives them a riddle about the honey that he scraped out of the dead lion. And you've got to remember that if Samson had observed his Nazarite vow, he never would have touched the body of that dead lion. But he did. He, he didn't pay attention to his vow. He did. He got the honey out of that, that corpse, and, and then uh, he eats it, and then he goes about making a dumb riddle and bets the Philistines 30 new sets of clothes that they can't answer it. They hear his riddle, they, they scratch their heads, and, and they don't want to lose their bet to Samson. And so they go and they threaten his bride-to-be and she tells them the answer to the riddle. And later on, they, they meet back up again with Samson. They give him the answer to the riddle and all oh, he's upset. And a big fight ensues and Samson kills 30 Philistines and leaves town. And because of that fight, the marriage never happens. See, the father-in-law to be, the father of the bride to be, takes the bride to be and gives her away to the best man. Gives her away to someone else. Later on, Samson comes back to town to, to gather up his bride and he finds out that she's married to somebody else. And boy, it gets ugly then. Samson burns down the grain fields of the Philistines. Philistines, they get mad. They, they've lost all their grain. They've lost all their crops. And they come and they surround the city of Judah. They're looking for Samson. They want Samson, demanding Samson. And 3,000 men of Israel go to find Samson. Now, do they go to find Samson so they can fight with him, alongside him, and, and take on the Philistines? No. No, they go looking for Samson because they want to turn him over to the enemy. Please don't miss that part. 3,000 of Samson's own countrymen go and get him 
bind him with ropes, and turn him over to the enemy. The enemy who has occupied their land. I, I read that and, and, and I see that it, it just seems that Samson in his life has acted like such an arrogant, self-centered person that his own countrymen don't even recognize that he's set apart for God. He's not living in such a way that they recognize that he is someone who's an instrument of God. They don't even see that. They just see that he causes trouble. They bind him with ropes. And the Bible tells us in Judges chapter 15, verses 14 through 15, that the Israelites take him to the Philistines. The Philistines gather around him. And, and then when that happens, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Samson mightily. He breaks the ropes. He picks up the jawbone of a donkey and he kills a thousand Philistines. He's victorious. God is still watching over him and protecting him. And up to this point in Samson's life, we've seen God deliver Samson from a lion. We've seen God deliver Samson from a fight against 30 Philistines. He delivered Samson from a relationship that would have been wrong for him. And then God delivered Samson in a fight against a thousand Philistines. And God did not deliver Samson in these situations because Samson was such a great faithful person. No. Samson wasn't delivered because of Samson's faithfulness. Samson was delivered because of God's faithfulness. God is always faithful. That's one of the greatest truths that I see in this story. I see the, the great faithfulness of our God. I see the, the, the capacity that He has to be patient and long-suffering with us. God is so merciful and so gracious. He's so compassionate. God continually delivered Samson over and over because God wanted to do a work through Samson. Now, now, you or I or, or people that we know, we might have given up on Samson after the first few times of trouble or after the first few times that he acted so arrogant around us. God did not give up on Samson. Even though Samson was making bad decisions, taking bad actions, God did not give up on him. God used those occasions to further his will. Now certainly God would have loved it had Samson gone down to Timnah not because he was interested in marrying some pagan woman. God would have loved it if, if Samson went down there to begin to deliver the nation from the Israelites because that's what he wanted to do because he knew that was on God's heart. But that wasn't the case. He wasn't going down there for those reasons and yet God still kept His promise. God was still faithful. And God worked through even those bad decisions and bad choices that Samson was making. God continued to try to do a work in him and through him. I love that. I, it reminds me of what's said in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that the Lord is long-suffering toward us. Patient. I, it's sometimes described as patience, but I don't think patience really captures it. Long suffering. That he sees where we're going wrong. He knows what we've done wrong. He knows all the bad choices and bad decisions we have made. And yet, look at that next part. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the Lord God reaches out to us. He longs to use us. He wants to, to work in us, to work through us. He wants to save us and put us to work in His kingdom. No matter what bad decisions, no matter what bad choices we might have made. Samson faced some battles. And in those battles, God granted him victory. Even the ones that Samson started out of ignorance and arrogance. It was always the Lord that delivered him. The deliverance came from God. As I close this morning, I want to talk to you about one more characteristic that I see in the battles of Samson. First characteristic was there was a disregard of authority by Samson. Second characteristic is the deliverance came from God. And the last thing that I want to see is the denial of Samson. 
See, after Samson kills a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey, the Bible tells us this in Judges chapter 15, verse 18. Then Samson became very thirsty. And he called to the Lord and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance by the hand of, of thy servant. I don't know if I like how that reads. Thou hast given this great deliverance by the hand of thy servant. And now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? But God split the hollow place that is in Lehi so that water came out of it. When he drank, his strength returned and he revived. Therefore, he named it in Hakore, which is in Lehi to this day. So he judged Israel 20 years in the days of the Philistines. Samson gets in this big old fight, uh, kills a thousand Philistines. And after this great battle, he is physically drained and he's very thirsty. He called on the Lord, acknowledging that, the, that God brought victory. And in perhaps a somewhat arrogant fashion... He asks for water. God provided water. In a miraculous way, God provided water for Samson, and Samson named that place in Hakore, which is translated as a spring for he who calls on the Lord. I find it interesting that Samson would use that name, he who calls on the Lord. We see Samson honoring God. We see Samson talking to God at the end of the battle. But I don't really notice it any other time in his life. The only time you see Samson calling on God is when he's thirsty and he's in trouble. He never seemed to be proactive about his faith. He never seemed to be prayed up. He never asked for wisdom before he made some uh, choice or some decision. And after these battles that he faced, Samson never asked or explored the question, what started this trouble? Why do these things keep happening to me? Samson uh, went through these battles. He saw the victories and he thought about his great strength. He saw the victories and he thought, well, you know what? The Lord has delivered me and used me again. Samson never explored the reasons for his battles or the root cause of his troubles. See, Samson fought a lot of battles, but he never fought the battle that counted most. He never fought the battle against his flesh. He never asked the Lord to lead him or guide him. Samson never took accountability for the problems that came into his life. He denied accountability, and for that reason, he never conquered that self-centeredness, that selfishness. He never defeated the enemy that was his flesh. For that reason, there was wasted potential in Samson's life. Yes, God used him. Yes, God gave him some great victories. But what could God have done had Samson fully and wholeheartedly given himself to God? God was only beginning to deliver the nation through him because Samson never fully gave himself to the Lord. You know, after Samson had these battles and and God gave victories against the Philistines, you never see the people of Israel rally behind Samson. You never see the, the people of Israel come alongside him and also take up the cause. You never hear the people of Israel say something like, Good job, Samson. We want to serve God like you're serving God. You don't see that. You don't hear that. Why not? Well, you don't see it and you don't hear it because Samson lived like a hypocrite. When Samson went to the towns of the Philistines, he was looking to fulfill the desire of his flesh. He wasn't looking to fulfill the work of God. He wasn't looking to fulfill God's will, to do things God's way. Now, I don't think Samson ever fully appreciated or embraced his calling or his commission from God. He never fully committed himself to being separated from the world and set apart for God. He never lived in such a way that people would point to him and say, yes, there's a person that knows the Lord. Yes, there goes a person who is devoted to God, who lets God lead him and guide him, who lets the Lord uh, make his decisions, who lets the Lord shape his words and guide his actions. 
You don't see that. You don't see that. And as a result, Samson was not able to fully deliver the nation. Samson never led the nation in revival. He never reconciled the people unto God. He never let God help him conquer the enemy that was his flesh. I, I think about that and I, I think about is that the case for us today in the church? Is that the case for us today as Christians? Are we living in such a way that the people of this nation would point to us and say, yes, there's somebody who's devoted to God. Yes, there's someone who loves God and loves others. Yes, there's somebody that, that lives out forgiveness. There's somebody who's kind and compassionate, forgiving others just as God has forgiven them. Are we living in that way that people would point to us and see that we are set apart for God? Are we living in such a way that God can use us to set people free from the enemy? Are we living in such a way that God could use us to start a great revival? Are we living in such a way that honors the sacrifice that was given for us? You know, if we want God to use us to our full potential, we cannot simply be content with God delivering us and saving us from the trouble and heartache that we create in our own lives. We must take ownership and fight the battles that matter most. We must fight the battle against selfishness, self-centeredness. We've got to do like Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul tells the church, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. And delivered himself up for me. Are we living in such a way that we're not overly concerned about our desires, that our, our will, our ways don't get in the way of the will and the way of God? Are we living in such a way that we're allowing God to continue to work in us and work through us? Are we living in such a way that points others toward Jesus Christ? Good question. Good question. I pray that the Lord will help us answer it with a good and godly answer. Would you pray with me, please? Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for this day. And Lord, I pray that you would bless this country. Father God, you know the things that are going on. Lord, you know the fears and the failures that have taken place. But God, you can use all things, Lord, just like you used those decisions and choices in Samson's life. Lord God, you can use our circumstances for your will, for your purpose. Lord, I pray that we would give ourselves fully to you. Lord, I, I pray that we would seek after your desires, seek after your will. Lord, that we would walk the path that you have set before us. That we would walk by faith. Lord, I pray that other people would see us they would want to know more about you. That they'd want to know more about Christ because they feel His touch. They hear His words. They sense His grace in how we operate. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us and use us to bless this nation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.